Welcome to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Today's guest is Jane Sherrard. She has an extensive background in public education and is driven all the way up from Halifax today to be here with us. So thanks very much, Jane. You're welcome, Dennis. And away we go. So your passion is the whole issue of um, French immersion, um, education systems, where students get placed, how they get placed, and um, we're definitely going to end in the latter part about what the solutions are, how to make this better. But maybe to get us started, um, tell us a bit about um, professional background, how many years have you been in education, and, and then as you wrap that up about what, what caught your eye about we need to be doing something a lot better than the way we're doing it. Well, I've been a classroom teacher for a number of years, 25 years, I think. I, uh, prior to becoming a teacher, I was involved in the Home and School Association at the provincial level. Uh, education's always been a passion of mine. I've been a lifelong learner and seem to have taken all of my degrees as an adult, so I'm interested in learning. But the real um, catalyst of why I'm sitting in your studio today uh, it happened in 2002. I was standing on a playground. I was a kindergarten teacher at a time at the time, and a little girl came up to me, and she was in grade one immersion, and she was a bright, perky little thing. And I knew, as a kindergarten teacher, that program would be perfect for her. It would be awesome for her, but it isn't for every child. So when she said to me, "Mrs. Sherrod, Dennis went back into English today because French is too hard for him." It made me think about the divisions that we saw in our learning at six years old. These little children, when I looked around the playground that day, were playing with their classmates. Mm -hmm. And who were their classmates? Well, for the English program children, their classmates were English program children. And for the French immersion children, they were playing with their classmates. That's the natural way children learn. As an early years teacher, I see kids making um, plans before they even get outside, making sure they're not left alone. They want to be included and have plans and get ready to go. But when you see a division like that on the playground, it made me very sad. Mm -hmm. And I had been planning on doing a master's degree, but I knew as a, as a mom and as a wife and, and having a full-time teaching job that it had to be on something I was interested in. I couldn't just start taking a bunch of courses. And that day when I walked on the playground, I needed to find out how other jurisdictions around the world were delivering second language without having the divisions on their playground, the divisions in our society that I was seeing. So do you have a master's in that? Yes, I do. I took it in administration on educational change. Okay, thank you. And where is it from? University of New Brunswick. Okay, great. Um, when you did that study, um, did the other jurisdictions have what the Société des Acadiens de Nouveau-Brunswick will do? And I'm a Quebec boy by birth, so I grew up in Quebec during the 70s and 80s when all of the uh, that language issue was going on. Um, so there's... We have to walk into the space of paradox, in a way, is where I'm going. So did the other jurisdictions have um, a group or a culture that was working hard to sustain or preserve its culture, as well as then have input into the design of an education system? That wasn't what I was focused on. I didn't really see that, no. Uh, what I was looking for were how they were successfully teaching second language and but there was no one in the world Dennis I could find no culture in the world that was advocating to abandon their first language to teach a second our literacy rates yeah. need attention that's so, just one part of it but so yes. to help clarify that then so in a French immersion program for an anglophone young student um, you're suggesting that um, they have to abandon their first language they are. The children in grade one and two right now, they're not having stories read to them that make them laugh or make them think. They're not able to use their incredible imaginations to write stories. There's, there's, there's been a, 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 a shift in focus. They, the Anglophone sector's mandate is to ensure that English is delivered to their children, but it's not happening. Okay. So can we go back to the storytelling bit? Sure. So are, are they not invited to tell the story but in French? 
And is that what you see as the, the creative tension for a young person to try to sort it out? I, I, no, I don't think. I think for some children that it's going, it's going to be a lot easier. Uh, research shows that the children that have a good, solid understanding of the alphabetic principle, they have good phonemic awareness skills, they have vocabulary already well established. And children that are, what we saw as kindergarten teachers, the children who are reading above grade level for kindergarten, they're not going to have difficulty in it. The children, however, that don't have their B's and D's figured out or their letters mm -hmm. and numbers figured, you put them in a language. Francophone teachers understand this. Mm -hmm. They understand the disadvantage children have when they come into the French schools not having the French language. Yet that's what our province and our politicians are advocating we do to English, do exactly what Francophones are trying to avoid. So for you, the heart of immersion programming creates a dysfunction in the child's learning curve? No, it creates a dysfunction in our English education system, in the Anglophone sector's education system. For, ch for some children, of course, it works fine. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we do have a streaming situation that we can't ignore. We're a morally conscious society. Mm -hmm. And as a public education system, surely... The majority of New Brunswickers understand that we can't continue to divide our children into have and have not classes. And the solution is not to put struggling and special needs children into French immersion. I mean, that would be terrible for them, putting them at that disadvantage. But not only that, that's still not putting the high children, the models that we would want to see in a public education system in the English stream. It's not going to work just one way. Mm -hmm. We need our children together and that's and the only way to do that is to put them into a system that believes in their abilities. Hmm. So in your years of experience in teaching in the school system, you've witnessed some of the, the challenges or the gaps, I guess I want to get to, that, that this child isn't being put in the best situation for them to succeed because of the system design. And as teachers, we're certainly not allowed to guide parents as to what program to place their child. I yeah. mean, even if we believe that we were setting that child up for failure, when I was in the system, they would bring children back from immersion that were falling behind, falling mm -hmm. behind. Every month, they were falling behind more and more and more. The gap was broadening. So mm -hmm. they brought them back into the system that the United Nations, that the International Reading Association, that the National Research Council's position on preventing reading difficulties in young children, we put them back mm -hmm. in a language they can speak. Mm -hmm. And that only makes sense. Their literacy rates immediately went up when Kelly Lamrock moved the entry point from grade one to grade three. That only is common sense. Is, is this part of the background that mainstream media can't get into because they only have so many column inches or they only have three minutes on a newscast to do a news story about why we continue to score the way we score provincially when it comes to national standards and our performance levels on literacy? Is it somewhat systemic in that how we've designed our immersion program that it almost sets us up not to, su not to succeed? You know, I, I have been around this in my mind a million times, obviously, and I can't for the life of me yeah. figure out why a minister of education would look at this data that I can show them and think it's okay. Yeah. I, I just can't. But I think we have one that looked at it and said, no, it's not okay. And Kelly Lamrock said, no, it's not okay. Mm -hmm. And they're men with strong moral conscience. And I, and I have to believe that Mr. Cardi is going to fix this. Mm. However, he can't talk about what needs to be fixed. Would the decision come at the ministerial level or would it come from somewhere else? There's, you can't be alone in, uh, you might be the lone advocate, but you can't be alone in the awareness that there's a systemic challenge. And if we changed it here and changed it there, and we'll get into how we create systems change <laughs> later, but, but there must be an awareness that we could be doing things a lot better in our education system. And some of it ties to the French Immersion Program, and then some of it's going to tie to funding. Um, Michael Fullen is a guru. He's a Canadian guru. People hire him from all over the world to improve their education systems. And he mm -hmm. said, any fundamental change in ed education needs to be in the hearts and minds of teachers. Hmm. Mr. Cardi needs to ask our teachers and our students, we, he needs to challenge them, do you believe we can build a world-class system? What would that look like? He needs to put it, that's who's going to fix it. The okay. teachers will fix it. Okay. 
This reminds me a touch of uh, the early 2000s. Um, education had gone through umpteen changes because of uh, policy changes, which were tied in part to some personalities within um, the civil service. And then a lady named Scrabo was brought in out of Alberta to do the Scrabo report. And if I recall correctly, her summation at the end was that there had been too many changes over too short a period of time, and the teachers didn't know which way was up. Mm. It reminds me of the current situation with French immersion, where it's grade one, gets bumped to grade three, discussions about maybe go to grade five, now come back to grade one, all that within a 10 or 12 year window. What, what's that been like for you to watch with your unique perspective on the impact of French immersion on the English school system? Well, that Scarabba report was, just fell in my lap. It landed in my lap the same year I started a master's degree. Like, it was perfect <laughs> because she took the PISA studies and she told New Brunswick, she told Dennis Furlong, our then Minister of Education, that the French immersion system was failing our children. We lost the large, the highest cohort mm -hmm. of our kids. And she was surprised by those results. Um, she also said in that report, her last was plan for change and then stabilize the system. She understood that we couldn't leave it as it was because she, she explicitly said in more than one occasion, it's your responsibility to teach all children and to give all children a fair education. She was very well of what was going on, yeah. well aware. <clears throat> when you say all children, um, there are many who will feel there's discrepancies between uh, Anglophone and Francophone systems and that the Anglophone system is not as uh, well-funded or well-equipped or whatever their perspective is. Can we walk into that? We're going to walk into some of the thin ice a little bit here because it's a discussion that needs to be had. Either philosophically you're here to teach um, all, t all children, which would be uh, the government's position ideally, but when it gets into implementation it seems like we've, we've lost our way a little bit with making sure all children are treated equally. And it divides on language, and it divides from language on money. Can you're willing to go play in that space a little bit? Because it's a it's a big one, and we got to start that conversation sometime. Um, I was uh, I'm on a fair number of Facebook groups. Uh, one of the ones I was on was Moncton News Chasers, and I got kicked off that site. I'm not on there now because I said <laughs> that Anglophone and Francophone children deserved equal funding. I was spreading lies. I was spreading hate. That's not true. I think there's a misconception mm -hmm. between our cultures and our languages that um, I think that, there, that the English system is being misunderstood because Heritage Canada and our provincial um, government have agreed to fund francophone schools more. They... Um, and in, but in doing so, the Frank, when you look mm. at the structures that these schools have to mm. uh, maintain, the Francophone school has one s program. Mm. We're funding four separate programs. Can you, can you list them for us? So that we the have grade one it? immersion, we have a grade three immersion going through, we have mm. a grade six late immersion going through, and we have a grade five intense in French. Now, when you're in a school that may be a middle school that had K to eight, there are three different report cards at grade six, three different assessments, three different, because they're all at very, it's so inefficient what we're doing, okay. but not just inefficient, expensive, Dennis, mm -hmm. expensive. We don't just have French books to buy for immersion. We Schools have French and English books. Mm -hmm. They have buses that they have to skirt around the districts to find mm -hmm. a school that outside of a child's catchment area that offers. Mm -hmm. a, there's all kinds of expenses that the Francophone schools don't have. So, so the Francophone schools wouldn't, to speak on, on their part of the formula, so they wouldn't have those four levels or four different pieces? They would only have one? That's right. What, does that one have a name? Um, it's the regular public education system. It would have French as the solid foundation. Um, they have English starting in grade three or four for I don't know how many minutes a week. I've had a couple of different... So, so there's no... It's there's just no, playing with the, the design. So there's no English immersion program in the Francophone school system? No, nor should there be. Yeah. Those no. children should be learning to read and write in the language they already speak. Yeah, okay. I, I just yep. wanted no. that to be clear because that's one of those things when people get yanging about this, to be street talk about it, you know, the, uh, they assume things are equal or, or the same. 
they think equal is the same. If that makes sense? Yes. But there's different needs for different cultures, for different languages, for different infrastructure. So is the English system overbuilt because of those four pieces that, that are in it? Whereas the Francophone system more streamlined um, and therefore more efficient? Well, the school districts don't have any choice. They okay. need to break classes up. You you might see in a school that would require three teachers and three classrooms. Mm. In, in, if immersion is going to be introduced, it may end up with three and a half classes because mm. of the way that, the, that it went down. It certainly costs more money. I requested a right to information to find out how much more it's costing now that grade one and two immersion are in our system and it's 20 million this year 20 million more okay. to fund grade one and two immersion more than it would have if we didn't have that okay i'm going to ask a silly question if the number of students in a classroom or in a school is the same so i'm teaching this class and there's 22 to 28 students in it and i have a budget for that based on the number of students in my class how is it more if it's a french immersion one compared to I'm just picturing a school, several classrooms. Each classroom has a sort of budget for it because it's based on the number of students in that class. So can you explain f for us what the additional cost is for an immersion program? Okay, can so let's say just hypothetically a grade five class, a grade, grade five in a school may have three grade five classes. Mm -hmm. If they had three grade five classes, now you have 25 children in each of those classes. Mm -hmm. Um, now, grade six, when it's introduced, you may have 60 kids join into the grade six French immersion. So now you still need three classes hmm. of immersion, but, you st but you'll have 15 kids left over in English. Now, if you look at our statistics, really, English are the only places where there are any significant numbers of combined classes. They keep combining them because in grade seven the same thing will happen and they'll only have a few and and so, so there's an attrition rate when it comes to french immersion and then students are shuffled over into the english stream if there I used to be correctly. not so much now mm -hmm. uh it's much more difficult for parents to get their children out of french immersion than it was out of french immersion is that what you meant? The attrition no. Rate? Sorry, I no, missed that. No, because I'm trying to follow the math a bit. Because okay. if I can follow it, maybe the audience okay, can follow sorry. it. Okay, sorry. No, it's good. Because um, you're taking us into what it's like. And we don't get access to that very much. So it's very important that we try to capture this. So you've got grade five, three classes. And you said when it comes to grade six, 50 other students arrive. Well, no, but... Um, when you because all of them aren't just going to we, we can't just divide those classes into three classes again because there may be two and a half classes of immersion or, or which they'll make into three classes okay. and then but you'll still have the leftover English children you can't just make three classes anymore okay and where did the leftover English children come from uh, struggling with French immersion they, and they need to be why did over. they stay there yeah. no they they didn't opt to go into French immersion they stayed in the English stream their parents didn't yeah. sign them over so it's not really that they got back into English they're just there okay I think that helps clear up why the, the immersion program would be a, a bigger financial strain I sort of get the student numbers exercise because there's always an issue with enough French immersion teachers to match the number of French immersion students coming through a system because um, there's a there's a flow gap there or, or a production of a qualified teacher gap there if that makes sense it does make sense yeah. I mean we don't have great French second language results in New Brunswick hmm. and in that to me gets back to the systemic change that if you keep tweaking a system every three or four years there's no chance for um, post-secondary education degrees to match where the gaps are going to be in the high school education system or the elementary education system for doing French immersion. So they might, you know, universities might graduate five to 600 teachers every year, of which maybe you know, what percentages are qualified as French immersion teachers, but then how many job opportunities are there in the school system, which then gets into how that school superintendent or um, school board um, allocated how many francophone or French immersion classrooms they're going to have. Mm -hmm. Am I following that yes. close? Yep, that's correct. That system change. 
And then you're coming in at the ground level about in a classroom how students are um, allocated to take this program or take that program and how that impacts their abilities or their test scores or? Well, I know um, in 2003, I was at a district council meeting in Moncton and Hillcrest School, one of the schools in Moncton ha that offer grade six late immersion program the year previous, they had asked, requested the District Education Council if they could deliver the grade six late immersion students their math in English instead of French because they had their French delivery resulted at the end of year, the grade six assessment showed they were in their 30s. So the district gave them permission to deliver their grade six math in English the following year and I was at the District Education Council meeting when they reported they doubled their scores because children had math delivered in a language they understood. Now you would think that you would take that information and, and ponder it and look what happened across Canada with people who are delivering the late immersion program. They indeed, yes, did start delivering math in French. Mm -hmm. or sorry, stopped delivering math in French and started delivering it in English. Yeah. But that school is delivering math in French mm -hmm. and probably every other late immersion school too. And with it will come a certain amount of struggle for the students to capture the concepts in the other language instead of in their mother language. Um, that touches closely then on teaching students in their mother tongue uh, in order to grasp all the concepts that they need and all the knowledge that they need. And then where does second language fit in? It's like you want to establish a base first of a certain skill set. And, and we're talking about young people as if they're machines. If they're very emotional. <laughs> There's an emotional element that's going to come with not feeling like you're doing okay in school or feeling like it's a constant struggle. And uh, we can't lose that. Uh, that little element because it's a main one. So I'm wondering then what's, what's, when you did your studies, how did they resolve that? Because they must have seen, you know, around the world and other places, they must have seen the performance levels dropping when trying to acquire the second language and sort of losing their base for the sake of this, uh, adding this extra dimension. Nobody did it. And I really focused on top performing countries. I studied Finland a lot. Mm -hmm. Finland's success, they were very, very similar to New Brunswick 60 years ago. They had really poor results. They had different programs all over the province or all over their country. country. Um, but they decided, Dennis, they decided to build a, a world class system. Mm -hmm. They decided. And when they did that, they, the, the, it gradually shifted into the educators' hands, and educators now say we want to keep politicians as far away from our programming as possible. Mm -hmm. and, but, that's, but that's what needs to happen. We need to decide if we had a white piece of paper, what would it look like? There would be no one in the world that would even design a system like us, mm -hmm. ours. No one would even think of it. Mm -hmm. It's so bizarre. So what did Finland do? Do you have elements they of They started of on one, yes, they have a non-inclusive, a non-selective system. A non-selective system. Which means? Which means there are no choices. They don't have optional pr choices. In, <laughs> at, at five years old, you don't have to determine your child's destiny. They put them in a solid education system, and as soon as those children walk through the doors, they're introduced to a second language yeah, in oral programs. Thank but you. their first language is taught their reading and writing their literacy that's more important that would be a huge shift for new brunswick's current culture around education to believe children should be learning to read and write in a language they already speak yes yeah. it would yeah because that you you don't have a choice you know you just this is how we're going to do it and everybody comes in and that's how they're going to do it so interesting in entry point so there's going to be uh, if New Brunswick's going to have an advancement in its literacy levels or other indicators that we use to measure, um, and if we adopt a, a model like you've just described from another country that has success with it, that had similarities to us 60 years ago, there's going to be a lot of letting go that has to happen and a very different conversation that needs to happen about how do we do well by our young people. 
And in turn, 20 or 30 years later, how do you have a healthier economy, healthier communities, et cetera? Because that's the end result um, of that. So everybody enters the same system in Finland. Do they have... Uh, do they have something like we do where there's a cultural element that's trying to sustain itself in a larger cultural element? They're a bilingual country. Hmm. And one of their languages has fewer than Francophones, yes. So there, I would say yes. So there's similarities demographically that way. That way. Um, because recently the Société des Acadiens nouveau brunswick came up with, um, in the Office of uh, Language Commissioner, uh, if I, I've got that wrong, but... Uh, there's a review about to happen on the Official Languages Act. And um, I believe they had a headline that said something to the effect that they, you know, they would like all New Brunswickers to be bilingual by a certain window of time. I think it was 50 years. Um, that harkens back to the 70s and Trudeau era, um, Pierre Elliott Trudeau era in Canada was trying to create bilingual population. I don't think the intent was ever to force the other language, whether it's English or French, into it. But it ties more to what you just described in Finland, where everybody comes in, and at the end of the process, they come out bilingual. Pierre Trudeau, in 1988, made an address to the Senate, and he said, Bilingualism will unite us. Duality will divide us. And until we come to terms with that, Dennis, until we allow our teachers and our, uh, from both sectors and our students to work together and build a, a, a system for New Brunswick that makes sense, hmm. because it's so messed up right now. Hmm. It's so messed up. And, and politicians can't open this discussion because it's too political. Yeah, it has to come from people. It has to come from us and maybe a healthy conversation on social media as a start. And in a couple of larger community forums, maybe, um, with the professionals involved together. It's interesting to note how the preservation of a culture can actually be supported by a bilingual population as opposed to it's eroded by a bilingual population. Can we wander into that space a bit? What I'm thinking of is uh, SANB will work hard at preserving their culture. That ties to language, because language is a lot more than just acquiring the skills of um, grammar and structure and communication. It's, it's bigger than that. Much like First Nation languages, it's, it's their culture, not just language. But somewhere in there, there's an ironic twist that might need to happen, like you just described from the Finnish example, <clears throat> that you actually preserve the culture by having a bilingual education system, as opposed to you've got a dualistic education system and you're always in that tension of trying to preserve the culture. Is, is that consistent? Is that little perception consistent with what your academic work discovered and in what your personal work discovered? I know that my very best friend growing up was Francophone. And when I went into her home, they all com communicated in English to me. I wasn't learning French to any ability that you'd have a conversation or even want to. Because they could speak English, it was easy for them to switch. If I, at 10 years old now, was going into that home with the education system I envision, they would enhance my ability to speak French because I'd have a darn good basis in it. Hmm. And we'd speak it. Hmm. And Francophones, it's almost impossible for them to protect their language because English people haven't learned it. Hmm. But if we did, if we started at five years old in kindergarten, hmm. when, when Mr. Lockyer was on the road trying to figure out when the best entry point was, grade three or grade one, well, I mean, I told them no, neither. Neither, get rid of it all. We should start in kindergarten. Let's just have them walking into our hmm. schools and, and, like Finland, have the expectation that, that they're going to hear French all around them. Right now, Dennis, if you're a teacher or a Francophone teacher or a French immersion teacher in an English school and you're on bus duty or you're on cafeteria duty hmm. or you are on any kind of duty or response outside of your classroom, you're speaking English. Because you're because you're not expecting everybody around you to know what you're saying. How but how different just that one thing would be that if you're hired to teach French 
immersion or to teach a, a subject in French at our school, to expect all students to lay, raise the level for all students. So if you met them in the hall or in the bathroom dilly-dallying too long, you address them in French. That's what you're there to teach. But we can't do that now because the expectation, because we've left 30% of the population out of policy 309, which is the second language policy. We don't even expect 30% of our kids to be part of that learning. So until we include everyone, until we build an inclusive, non-selective system that will encompass everyone with the goals being the same, there's no reason why Francophone and Anglophone teachers in this day and age with technology can't communicate and connect and, and decide what an awesome program would look like and map it mm. and decide on the curriculum. and decide. You look at, you know, when all you're looking for is a, a teacher that can teach French immersion, do you know why Quebec has such great math marks? Because they have math teachers teaching math. Hmm. Finland have professional teachers in their field. Hmm. That's the difference. It's not just, I mean, it's one thing to say this is how we can fix it, but there's a lot of fixing to do, Dennis. Hmm. There's a lot of learning. There's, there's a lot of curves. Hmm. I want to flip this on its head a little bit, which is great. Thank you for that. It was really good. Um, do you think we have enough resources? Do we have enough budget? Yeah, so you've got your system and you've put it together the way you envisioned it. And I want to get into some of the mechanics of that in a second. But let's let's get a premise established first. Do we have enough already? Do we have enough teachers? Do we have enough students? Do we have enough financial resources? Do we have enough research done? Do we have enough um, family support, community support? That it, all the pieces are laid out there for us to actually have a first-class education system. Yes, we sure do. So it's not an issue of resources. Here's what I think. I think that Mr. Cardi needs to send my schedule to whoever, wherever they decide on how many schools need to be built and classrooms and all that. I know there are companies that do that. Mm -hmm. Put all our kids together and, and administer to the teachers the schedule that I propose. And if he can fund that with the money that he has... Mm -hmm then I would say, yes, we have enough. I think we probably can because, because um, there are a lot of costs incurred that won't have to be duplicated. Mm -hmm. So then that gets down to um, where the integration of the two systems may occur, and that would be a letting go on both sides. But let's wander into another point first. Is it possible, in your view, that the identities of both the Francophone and Anglophone cultures can be sustained through a bilingual education system? I definitely think they can. One of the first things I learned uh, when I started my degree um, was that learning another language is good for us. Hmm. And when I figured that out, it was easy to go from there. Well, let's just do it. Let's just do it. We can do that. Of course it's sustainable. But it's building a belief system that we want to do it. There are a lot of people that, I, the, most of the people that I have very difficult conversations with are English people who don't mind my idea of let's take down immersion. They love that. Yes, that's good. Bring back the core subjects, English, math, and science in our English schools. They're all for that. But when I, when I extend that to how then we could bilingualize our kids, whoa, hmm. I don't want that forced on us. And there's a big opposition to that because they don't understand that it would be good for their kids. Mm. It would be good for us to learn a new language. So there's two pieces that I want to make sure we catch. One is that the Francophone culture can have confidence that a bilingual school system would preserve their culture, which is their prime concern, <clears throat> and that the Anglophone culture would need to recognize that learning that second language is a huge benefit overall, and they still sustain their culture because the base work that's been done has been done in the native tongue. Does, does that fit? Absolutely. Is that the direction that you want this to go? Absolutely. It ha there has to be compromise. Hmm. That's going to have to happen. I don't see how we can just take French out of our schools. Hmm. I, don't, I don't even think anybody would go for it. Well, at some point we have to insert Portuguese and um, uh, Mandarin, I believe. Maybe. You know, at some point. Yeah. Well, there you go. 
But it wouldn't, but the thing is, I remember an article, Kelly Lamrock was in the paper when he was working out of an African country, and he said, the kids here are learning three languages, mm, yeah. three. Yeah, like we, New Brunswick, we can, seriously. We can totally change the conversation once we expand the number of languages, you know. Uh, yeah. But we can do two, Dennis. Yeah, we the, have the teachers already in our schools. Mm. New Brunswick's in an unprecedented territory right now. With teachers already in our schools to teach it, with mm. a minister of education that says, mm. let's build a world-class system, mm. what would that look like? wouldn't be working separately. It would be working together. Mm. You're, when you do it with emphasis, which is great, about working together, uh, my interview with Jean-Marie Nadeau, past president of uh, Société des Acadiens nouveau brunswick He's a poet. He's an author. Um, couple of degrees, travel all around the world, recognized uh, I got to go back home to New Brunswick because that's where the work needs to be done. Um, when I asked Jean-Marie about what would you do to help, uh, you know, the two cultures um, get to know each other better, you know, so what's your solution for this constant tension? He goes, oh, I would grab the kids from St. John and I'd send them up to Bathurst for a summer. And I'd grab the kids in Bathurst and send them down to St. John for a summer. It's not that far. It's like four or five hours. It's not a deal. And they'd get them to know each other because a lot of them don't travel to get to know their own province. Um, the energy that you have with your design of uh, you know, a bilingual school system, it's got that same kind of energy to it. That when you're working side by side on something, uh, it all wants to fit together. It's not a threat, it's a compliment. You know? I want to get teachers and kids excited about this. Mm -hmm. I would love to see Mr. Cardi on every... A large screen in auditorium in September saying, do you want to help me? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Here's our results. Do you think we can do better? Hmm. Efficacy. Building efficacy. 20-year window? 30-year window? Because people are so used to like two or three years. Election cycles often get in the way in policy design and policy delivery, especially in the voluntary sector. They'll change the program funding. And next thing you know, a whole voluntary sector has to retool itself around in order to meet the new four-year window of how you'll get some money from the government. Education is slightly slower cogs in the wheel turn. It might take 10 or 12 years, but there's many studies that show it's a whole cohort. You need to stick to the program for a whole cohort before you start to measure it. So do you have a sense of um, when we do this redesign in the perfect world, it, and then sit with it for 20 years, 30 years to see the results? Or do you I think see the, the children, I, yeah, you'll see the results overnight. You'll see the results in the first year. They'll, we will have, our kindergarten children, I, they will be, if we, because in my schedule, I've allotted them 90 minutes a day. Hmm. Uh, and that's in oral language programs, like music. What better place to teach a child hmm. than music with the repetition and the rhythms and the patterns? Uh, art. They know their colors in English. Let's do them in French and and um, phys ed and buddy programs, enrichment programs, mm. assembly programs, showcasing events. Those can all be in French and English now if everybody's included in the goals. But I know with kindergarten children, with everything I know about teaching them, if 90 minutes a day they were exposed to French, I'm confident to say they would probably be almost at intermediate by the end of kindergarten, let alone have to wait to grade nine. Hmm. Because the, it, they get it. Language is easy for them. That's not the same skill set as learning to read. Hmm. That's different. Hmm. And when people say, oh, well, they can all, but they can't read. And that's not good when you put them in a program that stifles that. Hmm. And, and that's what we're doing with our grade one early immersion. And, it, and the grade three, it's, it's streaming kids. It doesn't matter what the French results are. Hmm. It's streaming our children into have and have not classes. Surely no one in 2019 thinks that's okay. Hmm. Hmm. It, it, it has to be torn down. That thinking, those divisions have to be torn down. Can you offer an example of what a, a day would look like for a student? You did little bits there, about an hour and a half of this or that. So if it's a bilingual school system and you've got English and French teachers working side by side, you know, down the hallways and in the classroom, you hear of both the languages bouncing just like at, how, at the house, at a supper time at a house, and you've got all the languages flying all, all over the place. Um, so what would a, 
a structure of a day look like? What would the curriculum or schedule look like in well, your, your mind? Dennis, if you saw what a teacher was expected, if you if oh, you had a degree, that's a whole other story. I, no, but I would come to you and I would say, oh, you're doing our grade four, Dennis. Welcome to our school. Here's your math curriculum. Here's your science curriculum. Here's your language arts document. Here's your computer document. Here's your, here's your, here's your, here's your. Mm -hmm. So you end up with documents like this. Mm -hmm. Teachers, it, it's unrealistic mm -hmm. to think that they can get through that, that they can test for it that they can do a post-test for it, that they can bridge the gaps of anything you might admit, where to even start. Mm. So if we're going to start with a white piece of paper, that's basically what it needs to look like. What I would recommend is three 90-minute day blocks, a 90-minute block for English language arts in English school, French language arts in French schools, uh, math and science, technology, some call it STEM, have that as a 90-minute block, that a teacher strong in math science is going to be delivering that block, and then have your French block of the music, the art, the phys ed. The, and, and, and that's not to say you wouldn't have English music, and especially in early years classes. It's often the heartbeat of early years classes. So in your literacy, you would have that. In your math, those things should still be there. But if we did that, 90-minute blocks. Then teachers could start in literacy, in that 90-minute block. What's important? What in the first term should kindergarten children know? What do we want them to know? Well, let's introduce to them patterns. Hmm. So if teachers decided, French and English teachers say, okay, well, in our first term curriculum, we're going to have patterns for kindergarten. Well, what if patterns when they went to music was brought up? And patterns when they went to art was brought up? And patterns when they went to phys ed was brought up. And we integrated these solid things we wanted kids to master and mm. build on. And we did that. And we allowed teachers to integrate these subject areas with the curriculum. And we take our health and put it in language arts. Mm. And take our social studies and put it in math, maybe, for geography, distance, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we don't need... 45-minute block. Oh, you've got phys ed. Everybody quick, close down. We're lining up. Hurry up, quickly, quickly. Gym teacher's going to be waiting for us. Go, let's go, everybody. And now you're moving you're across the school. And then you come back, and then you do the same thing. You interrupt your science lesson because you're going to music. And then you, it, it's, a, it's dysfunctional. Yeah, it's the, too many. There are too many things that are expected, yeah. and we're bound to fail. In, yeah. So you're talking about how a day is blocked off and the number of transitions in a day. And any amount of time lost in that transition, never mind what the student goes through as a, as the processing they have to go through to get ready to turn your head in this direction now, and then i got to turn my head in that direction now. It's, it's a, a lot of work that's not about acquiring knowledge or acquiring experience. And there's savings in that in this area. You're talking about how much savings would there be in this. Just in this one little thing alone. Take for an example, if you're the French teacher and you have the children for music next. Hmm. Well, in, in our world, as a classroom teacher, we bring the children in, we get them undressed, we unload them, we do da-da-da-da, we line them up and we take them to the music teacher. That's often what happens. But if you're the music teacher that has them first, you get them. And where do you take them? To your room. You don't even need a, cla you don't need a classroom to go to first before you go to the music room. So what I'm saying is these music rooms, the phys ed facility, the art rooms, could be classrooms. They're the classrooms. Mm -hmm. We would require, there would, it would allow you for three more classrooms, at least in the school, mm -hmm. to be utilized as classrooms because that's where the kids are going anyway. Is some of what you're offering based on what you learned from um, the master's degree? And, you know, you've used Finland as the example. So is that kind of how they structured their days in these 90 minute blocks? And that, that that teacher that's teaching that first block, that's also not the homeroom for the student, but you just start. You show up and you start. You don't have to go to homeroom, get checked in, and then have that first right. transition. Um, I, do, I have no idea. I do know this. I know Finland has the highest scores in the world in many of the subject areas, or among the highest, hmm. and they're going through a huge reform. The teachers are putting it through a reform of getting rid of subject areas. How much authority do the teachers have in the design work there? I don't know. I know with this new 
uh, thing they're doing. I know it's in conjunction with their department. They're working together. Because that's a typical systemic um, challenge where the top of the system is the ones that do the curriculum design, and then there's the teachers in this case who would be the delivering the system, be going, why are they making us do it this way? It makes no sense for the human experience of learning. Um, that Always that tension between theory and the actual delivery. You know, So if you integrate those two things a bit better, um, that would have to help the delivery side of it where teachers would have a say in the design. Oh, that's the only way it's going to work, Dennis, hmm. is if the teachers design it, if they map it. Hmm. Uh, we did an exercise that, like that in uh, Anglophone East. That's why I know it will work. There were too many outcomes, too many outcomes for teachers. So we got our teachers together, all the kindergarten together, all the grade one, all the et cetera, and asked them in each subject area, um, what are the most important things you want kids to know? And, and that was a very simple exercise, but very uh, effective mm -hmm. because we took these binders and brought them down to <laughs> something we could work with. Yeah, that, that sounds like um, all you really need are five guiding principles rather than a whole policy and procedures manual. And everybody in their own way will be guided by those five guiding principles. Um, oh, I just had a thought and I lost it about... Um, teachers and in the system oh the human experience of learning it's crossed my mind from time to time uh, from being a dad as well as reading and paying attention that it's always fascinating when a new theory on learning surfaces and then it catches on for some reason then it works its way into curriculum design and then it's applied through a system and yet at the heart of it for me and i'd like your thoughts on this is that humans have learned the same way since we've been human, meaning we acquire language a certain way. We acquire the skills to get through a day, um, use machines. Um, so how we learn biologically, physiologically, spiritually hasn't changed because we're just humans. <laughs> but there's all these different theories on how to teach math, all these different theories on how to teach languages, all these different theories on how to teach anything. Do you think there'll ever come a time when we can strip it down enough to just reconnect with the human and how a human learns as opposed to applying a, a new fancy theory that's got all kinds of funding and now we have to teach math with little blocks instead of regular math? My lack of understanding the name for it. But <laughs> thoughts on that? Um, I know Plato had an amazing system of education, and that's basically what he felt education's role was, was to make children want to do what they have to do, find their inner loves and passions and bring it out, and, and what you uh, need to teach that child, do it through that. Hmm. And, and we try to put so many pegs in, in the wrong fitting holes. Hmm. Our, our special needs children that are sitting in English classrooms... Yeah. We could do so much better, Dennis. Yep, yep. So play-based learning, basically, or the old Summerhill program from England in the 60s, for Pete's sake. You know, it was all based on following the, the direction and the energy within a student, within a structure, and within a certain design. But So when you talk about the bigger blocks in a day and then the success rate that Finland's had, um, that's what's triggering in my mind. That Oh, it gets to be simpler, not more complex. And, and when I did my reading recovery training, it was one Wednesday afternoon a month that I went to the district office and the teachers that were also in the training, we did what we did. But where our training came from was the children we were actually reading with. Mm -hmm. And we analyzed them and we looked at them. Why are they making that mistake? What, mm -hmm. what strategy did they use? And, and we're taking those peelings off mm. to see what's happening. Every early years teacher should know what I know. Mm. Everybody should know that. Mm. We don't have, we're not there yet. But when you look at teacher training, that piece is so important for our children, that we train our teachers, that they understand. But that was one Wednesday afternoon, and the rest, and, and the rest of the learning came from working with those students. I believe our teachers should go through exactly that kind of rigor. One Wednesday afternoon, be learning about a subject area that you're teaching, 
working together at it, getting becoming masters at it. Mm-hmm. And and if we do that, we will evolve into a world class system. Now to do that I had time built into my schedule to work with a student or students, and we need to do that. Dominique Cardi absolutely needs to do that. He needs to allow every teacher, if he follows my schedule, every teacher in this province will have 45 minutes a day to work with a student or a group of students, uninterrupted. It's one thing to work with you here, but Johnny, sit down, and Mary, and yes, go to the washroom, take the key, all that stuff. It's not the same. It's not the same. And, and so during those learning times, we can give teachers 45. Now, can you imagine how much that would advance our weak students if every day, every teacher in this province had 45 minutes to work with someone who's struggling? Hmm. Just that. Hmm. And that's why when you asked me about the funding, if he funds my schedule and there's enough in the budget, then we have enough. It's almost time to wrap up, believe awesome. it or not. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, do you have your information when you referred to my schedule? Um, do you have that somewhere online? Mm, it's been posted on Facebook a few times, okay. people requesting it. Okay. Um, so it is accessible and you're comfortable sharing it, etc. so sure. others can see. Um so we'll make sure it's either in the comments um, section or right up in the body description of the show when we do post the show up. And is that okay? Sure. Great. How would you like to um, close us out? I guess if I had one message to send out, it would be that our children will unite us. Hmm. That's it. I went to the judge and Judge Drapeau um, had to rule on whether or not to allow school buses to have English and French children together on them. And um, we need to meet, we need to go there. He said it was okay to do that. He said it was okay. Well, let's do it. Let, not even for the savings of money. Let's just do it. Let's start there. What a baby step that would be, but a giant leap. Hmm. Our kids will unite us. Thank you for this. You're welcome. Great conversation. You're welcome. To be continued, I suspect. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. And thank you for watching. As always, be good, have fun, and love each other.